Hey, Brandon here, and thank you for tuning in for today's episode of Transform Your Workplace. In today's discussion, I have Dr. Melanie Katzman. She's the author of the new book, Connect First, 52 Simple Ways to Ignite Success, Meaning, and Joy at Work. And I think by the time this releases, Connect First will be released on October 22nd, so probably a week or two after this podcast. I gotta say, like, this is a great book. It's actionable. There's a lot of simple ideas that you can implement. I encourage you to get your notepad if it's possible, of course. Uh, a lot of you are probably commuting, so don't do that. But definitely go back and listen to this podcast again if you're driving or you just can't write notes because there's a lot of things throughout this book that you'll be like, I'm gonna just take this back to the workplace and it's gonna be easy to implement. So, anyways, I wanted to mention that first. But more about Dr. Katzman, she is a business psychologist, advisor, and consultant to the world's top public and private companies, government agencies, and nonprofits. She's also the founder of Katzman Consulting and a founding partner of the social enterprise Leaders Quest. Katzman was a senior fellow at the Wharton School Center for Leadership and Change Management and co-created and hosted the show Women at Work on SiriusXM Satellite Radio. And she's been featured across so many publications, Financial Times, New York Times, O Magazine, and much more. It was a pleasure to have her on the podcast. And I really hope you enjoyed this episode. So definitely reach out to me on LinkedIn or Instagram or even via email. I'd love to hear what you thought about this particular episode. And if you want more stuff like this, this particular book is all about how to connect with people and create more engagement at work. I think for HR professionals, and business leaders, senior leaders who have a lot to do with the culture and people practices are really going to get a lot out of this episode. So again, thanks for listening and can't wait to hear what you think about the podcast. I'll step out of the way and talk to you next week. Hey, Melanie, it is such a pleasure to have you on the podcast. Welcome. Thank you so much. My pleasure to be here. Your book, Connect First, 52 Simple Ways to Ignite Success, Meaning, and Joy at Work. It is out in October. What's the date of your release? October 22nd. Thanks for asking. October 22nd. Yeah, this book is jam-packed with ideas that are not only just ideas, but they're actionable and they're simple to implement. So I want to go through some of the book. There's 52 chapters. We're not going to go through everything. I wish we had time for that. But I also want people to go get your book because there's a lot of good stuff in there. But let's talk about why you wrote the book originally. And I want to start with a quote that you actually saw on LinkedIn that I pulled this morning. In the preface, you'd summed it up nicely. And I think it illustrates the point probably why you wrote the book. And I want you to respond to it after I mention it. So quote says, the truth is that organizations are run by people and people run on emotions. Our feelings supply the energy to fuel our pursuit of profit and purpose. They are formidable and universal. They can't be ignored. Yet, to our great detriment, we have long pretended that emotions have no place in the office, end quote. So I pulled that out because I feel like we should bring emotions to the workplace. Mm -hmm. I think you're saying the same thing. So what's your take on that? Absolutely. So Brandon, one of the things that has been unique for me in my career is that I've been a psychologist in the corporate corner office, boardroom and at the same time also been a clinician treating people in private psychotherapy sessions. So unlike many people who are consultants with MBAs, my degree is actually a PhD and in clinical psychology. Mm -hmm. So I'm really tapped into the inside and how that affects the outside expression of one's behaviors, their values. And so I'm always looking at the ways in which people change from the inside out. And In this unique position of really having opportunities to talk with people about what really matters to them at work, what I've heard over and over again are the very same things, whether I'm talking to someone in an internet startup, somebody who is an established banking institution, I've worked around the world with people who are operating at very challenging situations in society, people who are filled with privilege, and yet What I see over and over again is that we are so incredibly alike and yet spend Mm -hmm. a great deal of time and energy masking that, pretending it's not there. And actually, the energy that goes into pushing the emotions away, when converted into a release of emotion that is a connecting tissue, you have phenomenal positive effects. 
for the individual and for the organization. We just have to not be afraid of letting that emotion out, being vulnerable and being ready to recognize our shared similarity. I couldn't agree more with that. When you start writing this book and developing the ideas around it, did you have a certain reader in mind? Like, who do you want to read the book? What do you expect them to get out of it? And what do you expect them to do with it? It's a great question. One of the things that always bothered me was that I would go to the business section and I would see lots of books with like bold letters, red spines, written for titans of industry, by titans of industry. (laughs) And I thought, wait a second, we all go to work. Most of us do. And we all could use a little help. And so I wanted to write a book that first and foremost was putting the responsibility for change in the individual's hands. So that rather than a corporate initiative that says, we are doing this to you, I wanted to give everybody, no matter where they are on their career trajectory, the tools to be able to find meaning and success at work. Now, when you say I want something for everybody, you run the risk of writing something for nobody. For nobody, yep. (laughs) So in the book, I've made a real effort to not only have 52 simple ways, so you can have one for every week, if you want to have you know, a challenging curriculum for yourself or your community. But I also have two case studies for every chapter. And I purposely juxtapose case studies from different parts of the world in different sectors to demonstrate how, in fact, you can write a book for everybody. Because when you peel the skin back underneath, we're all wired the same way. We're wired to connect. We're wired to make a difference to contribute, to feel proud, to feel like we belong. You stated early on in the book that this book is by far the cheapest transformation program that any employee, manager, or HR director will ever come across. How so? Brent, I think that you, me, many of the listeners, I'm sure, have been part of large-scale corporate programs where there's a great deal of fanfare, events, people fly in from all over, expensive speakers, trust falls, cooking classes. But at the end of the day, too often, they are event-driven. They are being done to us, not with us. And the purpose of the book was to create a shared language that people could have with each other, even to be able to bookmark and say, hey, here's the chapter on share information and slip it onto your boss's desk. Or here's the chapter and say, got it, to recognize that you got an instruction. Slip that onto your team member's desk. I wanted to give companies a way to make change happen every day in small ways that are doable, that cost nothing. And by contrast to big programs, this is the everyday actions that drive a big impact. And it's the price of a book. That's it. And it even tells you how to connect with people who are working remotely. And so you don't have to be in the same place to make that kind of person-to-person connection. So I wanted to get away from a lot of the office drama and a lot of the large scale expenditure that in many ways, I think, takes the responsibility away from the individual. Because ultimately, if I don't change myself, nothing's going to change around me. Yeah, no, I couldn't agree more, especially after reading the book too. I'm like, there's so many I'm like, oh my gosh, this takes five seconds to implement. Like, why don't I just do it? And so I think, you know, for somebody reading this, you don't have to spend a lot of money to do any of this stuff. It's more just about from within. Like you said, from the inside out, I really think it starts from within. And your book lays it out. I mean, there's literally bullet points of how to like implement it. And it's fantastic. I really appreciate you reading it and taking the time to you know, recognize even on the show that if some of this is a mindset. You know, like we walk into the office and we're already processing in our own mind what we're going to do that day, or we're looking at our phone, or we're listening to our headset. So just the most basic sensory experience of looking at somebody, smiling, saying hello, and calling someone by their name, I mean, it's so simple, but yet we don't do that. Or I've been interviewed for programs about networking. And one of the things I say is, do you talk to anybody in your elevator? If you're riding 35 35- <laughs> stories up. There's a lot of conversation that can happen. <laughs> no, they're staring at their phone. That's <laughs> what they're doing. Their <laughs> they got their AirPods in. They're right. not even paying attention. And every once in a while, you know, you may have like those screens in the elevators that have the news and people are watching the news or pretending to. Unreal. Right? So I'm like, come on, you work together. You're commuting, if you will, internally in the same building. Just look up and say something. Most people 
are so receptive to an approach that's a friendly one, but we're all afraid to make the first move. And so at the most basic level, the book encourages you to look and see who's around you. And then we go into much more detail about you know, ways you can help people feel good and stand up taller and find meaning and pride. But the most basic level, look up, say hello, and ask someone what their name is. <laughs> it's just not that hard. Take your earbuds out. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I love it. I'm sure listeners get annoyed with me, but whenever I read a book and there's quotes that jump out at me, I always like to write them down and then say them on the show. And there's one in particular that I think it really sets the stage nicely for the seven sections that you have coming up. We're not going to go over all the sections of the parts like establish respect, engage all of your senses, become popular, grow loyalty, resolve conflict, fight fear, and have a big impact. So the book is laid out that way. And there's chapters underneath each with a lot of action items. But this quote that I pulled, I'm going to say right here. So quote is, what is shocking is how often we forget that our colleagues are people just like us. We become so easily enraged by that other person whose motives are unclear and whose reactions make no sense. We often have blinders on when it comes to our own behavior and a magnifying glass when assessing offenses we have endured, end quote. And I think it illustrates your point about starting from the inside out. And in your book really outlines how we can make change within ourselves, So that way, we can be happier at work, connect with our people better, people will be more engaged, they'll have more meaning, they'll be tied to the business. Is that kind of how you see it as well? Exactly. And I think that one of the things that people often are puzzled by is, why did he do that? Why did she say that? And I ask people to check the emotional mirror. Start with, what are you feeling right now? Are you feeling slighted? Are you feeling disengaged? Are you feeling excited about the upcoming project? Now, what are the odds that the other person is feeling that? And why might they feel that? So you're feeling highly disrespected by the person who's working on this project with you. Before you get so angry about them, Is it possible that disrespect exists between the two of you? So if you feel it, maybe they feel it. And maybe that's the place where you start the conversation versus an assumption of negative intention. So it really changes the way you start to look at an interaction. It becomes more of a collaborative effort to kind of decode the emotion. And the way you start to solve the mystery is you first need to pause and check on your own emotional state. Yep. You know, and again, we're always so focused on action and getting things done. And we live in a speed culture in which everybody has time poverty, right? So there's never enough time. There's never enough resource. So we're always driving to the finish line. And as a result, what suffers are the relationships that can be enhanced by just that pause, that little bit of punctuation that allows you to stop and say, what's going on for me? What am I feeling in this moment? Let me test that with my colleague. That often can clear the air beyond belief. It's one of my coaching magic tricks. And I encourage you and your listeners to try it because if I feel it, they may feel it. And let's start a conversation from that perspective. I so agree. You know what drives me nuts is that you even said the word assumption. I think people make too many assumptions, they make up stories in their head about the other person. And instead of, you know, looking from within, having some awareness around how I'm feeling, or what I'm doing, or what kind of actions and my behaviors and all that, and then having the courage to have an open dialogue with the other person. I think your book really will help people if they're having trouble with that. But it just is crazy how people just don't do that. They don't do that. And you know, one of the things I tell people is you can't put an emoticon at the end of a sentence and make it okay. I do that. Come on. Yeah, you're calling me I'm up. I'm sorry. <laughs> We'd have to become pen pals, not podcast pals. What I see is that people will have a difficult conversation or raise something that's complicated. They don't have full agreement. And then they end with an emoji. And I'm like, no, you know, you're cheating. And it's going to simmer underneath. And like the pot that's simmering, eventually the top blows off. And so rather than wait till the top blows off, take the time to have the conversation. And I think part of this is people are afraid that things will take too long, they'll get too complicated. But most of the time, you speed the work by clearing the conflict. And so I have a whole section in the book around 
fighting fear. You can't have a relationship if you haven't had a conflict and cleared it. Otherwise, you just have like a happy, clappy, pretend interaction. To me, real relationships are forged as a result of having dealt with a challenge and come to the other side. Then you have a shared experience and the confidence that you can get through difficulty. If everything's easy, then I don't really see that as a strong relationship. So we shouldn't be afraid of these things, you know? Yeah, no, I so agree. I want to run through some of the chapters. Obviously, there's 52 of them. We're not going to go through everything. But there are some that I pulled from different parts. And I want to start with the part number one, established respect, and actually chapter one. And the reason I started with this one is because I love to smile. And I always make it a point and I'm very cognizant of whether or not I'm smiling. So in chapter one, you suggest smiling more to enhance the mood all around us, probably the mood within ourselves as well. Mm -hmm. And a quick story for you. The reason why I wanted to use this example was the other day, I don't know if I was just having a bad day or I was anxious about something, but I was driving to a meeting and I caught myself in the mirror just frowning Mm -hmm. and I can feel it from within. And I just, in my head, I was like, I'm going to force a smile and I'm going to look at myself being goofy. And I had this cheesy smile on my face, but I felt better immediately. And I all of a sudden became happy. So you even suggest that when people get down, make sure to walk into a room and smile. When you're interacting with people, always make it a point to give people a real genuine smile. So whether or not you have to fake it right before you walk in, but make sure it's genuine as you're interacting with people. Is that kind of what you have in mind as far as the smiling? Yes, I think one of the things that you're making, you know, the point of Brandon is to say that it feels like a fake because I'm intentionally doing something against how I'm feeling now. But the act of smiling gets biology to work for you. So when you smile, you're actually shifting your biological environment and you are setting off a trigger of events, positive events with the people around you. If I smile at you, you will smile back. It is the rare person who won't. I'm not talking about like a creepy person who's trying to engage you in some sort of shady situation. I'm saying you're walking down the hall, someone smiles at you. We almost instantaneously smile back before we even realize we did it. And this is hardwired in terms of our own survival, our own desire to bond and connect to other people. So by smiling, it's not just this light superficial thing of, Oh, pretend you're happy. It's actually smile to help you get happy. You know, there's a lot of conversation when I was writing the book with my agent and with my editor about starting with smile going to sound too superficial. I said, no, it's critical because it sets the stage for what I really want people to understand, which is your biology will work for you, that we are wired to connect, that we are wired to release oxytocin, the bonding hormone. And when that is released, we are calmer, readier to take risks, admit errors, to engage in the unknown. We want to, in whatever way possible, keep our biology in a flow state of positivity. And that starts with something as basic as a smile. So it's not superficial. It's not fake. It's an ignition key. It activates the system. See, I just need somebody much smarter than me, especially somebody who has some fancy (laughs) PhD degree to tell me that there's something actually happening when I force a smile, that something in my brain is actually happening. I'm actually happy afterwards. I'm glad you illustrated that for me and and helped me understand. That's what all those letters behind my name are for, right? (laughs) Yeah, you're not going to bill me for that, are you? (laughs) In chapter three, you talk about the words thank you. And by the way, this is completely free again. This is another thing that's easy to do. What is it about the words thank you that can transform the way we interact with people and why the hell don't people do it more? So one of the reasons I am told over and over again that people don't say thank you, which is akin to why they don't say please, is it's your job. Like it's your job to answer this request from whatever customer. Like yes, it is. But let us also recognize that when someone does something, They want to be appreciated for it. And thank yous cost nothing. Sometimes a thank you is literally thank you. Sometimes it's a post-it note that you just stick on somebody's computer because post-it notes stick around for a while. Sometimes it's a picture you take with somebody and just send it to them going, thinking of, you know, that great pitch that we did. I work with a client who 
one of the things she does, she's very senior global executive. She'll take a picture when she's with teams and she's visiting around the world. And she just sends a quick note with a picture of herself with whoever she visited and says, thanks for the time and all the insights. Do you know what that means for the person low down in the organizational totem pole to get something from the boss? It means the, the world. world. Right. This doesn't cost anything. And it just says, I see you and what you did. And that makes us all feel like we matter. And when people go to work, they want to feel like they matter. It means as much, if not more, than the money you make. Yeah. Further on, in Chapter 8, you talk about attention and giving people attention. So what do you suggest are some easy ways that we could be better at acknowledging others? I think thank you is a great start, but what are some other ways? ways? And again, when I say this, there may be some people who are rolling their eyes in their cars, they're commuting to work, but trust me, it doesn't happen enough. So well, everyone who's listening, if you're guilty of this, you'll know, is when you start a meeting, make sure everybody knows who's in the room. It sounds so simple. And that's whether it's a virtual meeting or a regular meeting. Who's here? Make sure everybody has a chance to say at least like one line before the meeting starts. And if you can, introduce each person in the room in a way that makes them feel proud and connected to whatever is happening. Because by introducing people, everyone, first of all, knows who's there. By introducing them in a way that respects their expertise, whatever it might be, even if they're the note taker or the tea server, you're validating their presence and recognizing their contribution. And when you make people or invite people to speak at the beginning, again, it gets them engaged and gets them activated. And so what we want always is to make sure people don't drift away. As soon as their attention drifts, they go to either thoughts that aren't related to the activities or they check their phone and that undermines the productivity. So attention is very powerful. Who I see, whose words I validate, who I invite to sit at the table, but make sure that there's chairs for everybody. Make sure everyone knows who's in the room. When you're on a conference call, make sure everyone knows who's on the call. And if you can, even to say, what do you see out your window? Just a quick way of grounding everybody. You know, we're working across time zones or locations, just something that just says, all right, we're all people about to start a conversation, but let us know something that makes me understand or visualize what's happening around you. Because that context will then help you have a more quality-driven conversation. I love that. And actually, when I was reading the book, I jotted down the idea you have about just scanning the room and making eye contact with people. You don't even have to really talk, but just acknowledging people just by looking at them in the eyes. So if you're about to start a meeting, just looking at them can make all the difference in the world. Because oftentimes, and I'm guilty of this, I walk into a room, I might look at one person, maybe say hi to them, but then my head's down. I'm probably looking at my phone for a couple of minutes, looking at an email right before the meeting starts. But what good is that? Because we're about to start a meeting where we're all connecting. And how are you supposed to connect with people if you're not even acknowledging them originally? So I'm going to be better about that. I'm going to promise nice. you that. But I love that I idea. Said, after you do that, send me an email with an emoji and let me know how you did. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're killing me. I love it. In chapter 11, I'm going to give you a chance to explain this because this is good stuff. You suggest touching people at work can make the workplace more human. Now, HR people listening to this are probably yep. having a heart attack. So what do you <laughs> mean by touching people? And I know what you mean, yeah, but I want to give you a chance to just elaborate on how, right. so how important this could be. You must have been a fly on the wall when people were editing my book over at McGraw-Hill. <laughs> they were like, <laughs> Melanie, this is the Me Too era. What in the world are you doing? Yeah, exactly. So let me be really clear. Get out your highlighters. Highlight appropriate touch. An appropriate touch is a quick tap between the shoulder and the elbow. Like a very quick light tap that's like, hey, good to see you. Thanks for that. When I'm saying touch, I'm not talking about hugging, kissing, picking somebody up and carrying them to another desk. None of that. This is not flirtatious. This is a light touch that actually research shows us increases compliance. If you go to a canvassing area where people are trying to get signatures or you go to automobile sales floors, people who actually do a quick touch will get somebody's attention and actually often their compliance. And it has to be light, appropriate, quick. And it's just a way of saying there's another human here. So a light 
appropriate non-sexualized touch. Now, there are some people for whom any kind of touch is going to be uncomfortable. Know your audience, know your room. Do not, if somebody's culture or personality does not allow for that, don't do it. But I don't want people to leave this book feeling that we can never share an appropriate quick light touch because it's just too important to humanizing the interaction. I so agree. Years ago, I'd read the five love languages. And then there's also the follow up five love languages at work. And they're the same languages, but they're just all like little different. Physical touch is actually one of mine, both on at work and my personal life, and they mean very different things. To your point, like, you know, a simple high five with one of my buddies at work could be a point of connection and a simple tap on the shoulder. And it doesn't have, there's nothing sexual about anything like that. And it doesn't have to tiptoe the lines. But I so agree with you. There's ways to connect with people, just a simple touch. But again, knowing your audience is really important because there's a lot of people, like really close people, where physical touch may be important to them. We'll give them each other a hug. But there's other people that's just not right. okay. And so and knowing never, your audience and is actually, really important. Hugs are really tricky. I'm a hugger myself, but not without asking, right? Because they're just people Correct. are not yes. comfortable. I mean, even a handshake that lingers too long or is too strong can feel inappropriate. <laughs> yeah. So yep. I think with touch, it is always quick. Always. You know, if it's someone you know better and you know that that's something that you can do, okay. But actually, the kind of touch we're talking about, like the touch on a shoulder, the touch between a shoulder and an elbow, these are quick moments. These are not lingering, mm-hmm. painful, not grabbing you by the shoulder or even shaking you and go, hey, buddy. Because some of that can feel really uncomfortable for people. Yeah. I'm glad you clarified. I knew you would do a great job at that. But when people get to that chapter, I think they'll be surprised at first, but then you do a really good job of explaining that. So thank you for that. I was just going to say a very quick anecdote, which is one of the case studies there was about my very dear friend and colleague who started to do work around bringing people to see individuals they might not otherwise engage with. After she was in an AIDS clinic and she walked in and somebody reached their hand out to shake hers and she withdrew hers. And she said, intellectually, she knew that was wrong, that she knew she wasn't going to catch AIDS from a handshake. But the fact that her visceral reaction was to pull away made her realize that she had created an untouchable situation. And if you think about the Indian caste system, what's the worst situation you could be in? You could be an untouchable. So I think touch is so powerful because if you are the untouchable, you are so isolated. And so I just wanted to kind of give an example of one of the little case studies that make you realize that sometimes we shy away from people without realizing it. So it's not just the act of a touch, but it's also consciously being aware that we shouldn't be afraid if there is somebody who is reaching their hand out to us. I love the ideas you presented in later on in the book. I think it's part four about abundance mindset versus scarcity. How could we use those mindsets, particularly the abundance mindset to grow loyalty within others and to have a bigger impact? I mean, I think it's the old half, the glass is half empty or the glass is half full. And if we see life from abundance, we're much more ready to share, to give. And if you see that you have something to give, it makes you feel like you're not in a depleted state. So if I run around all the time going, I don't have time to even have this conversation or I'm so afraid that I won't get a promotion unless I do this and I don't share the opportunity to someone else. You create a negative force field around yourself because people feel that turning inward and you're kind of holding on and not sharing. And you also deprive yourself of the opportunity of experiencing the joy of giving. It is very much a mindset orientation. We all have something to give. Sometimes it is just the space to store something. Sometimes it's just the stranger who gets your charger on the train so that they can continue on and doing their work as you're commuting to work. Or sometimes it's being able to offer a translation for someone who's struggling to communicate in another language. So we all have something to give. The question is, what is it that you want to give and recognizing that it will feel good 
to help others. I mean, it seems like such a basic golden rule, but <laughs> you know, some of these things you say it out loud and you can see, hear people going, but of course, it's like, but of course, but of course, if you did it, I wouldn't have to say it. <laughs> you know, so exactly. People need a reminder about this stuff. Sure, some of these are basic, but people need a constant reminder. Yeah. And I also think what isn't basic is that there are things that we have an abundance of that we don't realize we have. And so sometimes there's the person who's just more comfortable getting people together to go and grab some lunch at the office. They don't have a big position with a fancy title or a fancy office, but yet they're the ones who can facilitate a really positive work environment. So it's also recognizing what are your gifts and how do you want to share them? Because it allows you to be recognized in so many different ways. And so it is about sharing, but it's also about recognizing and honoring what we have so that then we can give it away. Well, like there was an example in the book about, I see all the time, but people getting pay raises. So in any business savvy person would know that there's no like finite piece of the pie. We can grow the pie by growing business and profits and whatnot. But yet, why is it when people get raises, some people get jealous versus saying, good for you, you deserve that. There's an abundance for everybody. We can all get this, but congratulations on it versus just saying like, well, they didn't deserve that. You know, like that happens all the time, right? You know, a number of places in the book where I try to encourage people to realize that if you compliment someone, you're not putting yourself down. You're actually demonstrating that you're in a position to make an evaluation that somebody's work is positive. So it's actually a way of affirming yourself. If somebody is doing well and you compliment them, you are giving them an opportunity to feel good in your presence. That good feeling that they have in your presence is likely to generate more opportunities for you to be with that person. And I encourage everybody I work with, and I write about this in the book, to be a magnet. You want to be the person who, when your name comes up on their phone or your email shows up in their computer or your name is on Slack, whatever, they want to respond to you. You want to be the person people are drawn to. And the way that happens is when you are able to share happiness for other people, when you're able to share the things that you have. So I really encourage people to think about sharing information, sharing praise, sharing invitations, sharing resources, anything that you can do to help somebody else have an easier time at work will come back to benefit you so many times over. And this isn't about a transactional, I do this for you, you do it for me. It's about a mindset of kind of coming in with, I want to help, not I want to hold on to everything for myself. I want to talk about one more and then we'll wrap up and I'll let you go. So in chapter 49, I pulled a quote that I think illustrates the ideas in this chapter. You said, rather than pretend you are Peter Pan, recognize that growing older isn't an assault on reason. It's a ripening of wisdom, end quote. So the chapter is really 60s is new 30. That's the title of it. What do you hope people will take away from this idea? So there's so much to say about the topic of aging at work. What we see is a real fear often about people staying on past their prime that, or people staying on even quasi in their prime, but blocking the advancement of others. And so you have attention from people who are trying to move up, feeling blocked by the older people in their organization. You have a frustration with millennials or Gen Zs from an older generation. And what I want to say to people is there's an opportunity to really work together. If you can Take a look at the energy and the technological savvy and the inquisitiveness of your younger members of the team and match that with the gravitas and experience and pattern recognition of the older members of your team. And you can actually get these two ends of the spectrum together and really change the world. And instead, what happens is we end up in situations where people are pushed out of organizations at a point when they can make a huge difference. Or individuals are leaving their organizations because they don't feel like they're interested anymore. And as a result, the leaving a company with a great deal of platform and leverage to start up a nonprofit where they then hope to raise money to affect change. And I'm like, why splinter yourself that way? That actually, as you get older and you can see how you can connect the dots, use the platform that your work may allow you to have and combine that 
with the wisdom you have to navigate the organization and the personalities, and where possible, partner with the people who are younger. And that's where really powerful change happens. And so rather than being afraid of aging, really see that as this is a great opportunity for the individuals and for the company. Of the 52 chapters and ideas you have in the book, which is your favorite? And really, which do you hope that people, if they take one thing out, do right away? It's chapter 52, which is dream. Good, yeah. Because chapter 52 really encompasses everything. Now, I started the book with a smile and I end with a dream. And I really believe that work, no matter what kind of work you do, no matter what position you have, you all have an opportunity to create a world that feels good for yourself, for the people you work with, and the community you inhabit. And every person and every job can make a difference. But you have to be willing to have that dream, to then take the actions to execute it. And that chapter really encompasses everything in the book. Because to make a dream come true, you've got to do everything that I've told you in the book. But I think that it's all possible. And so although I have a, I think, a realistic eye about the challenges that individuals and organizations have, I'm ultimately an optimist. I believe that people can change and make a difference, and they can be successful and joyful at work. And that's why I wrote the book. My guest today has been Dr. Melanie Kasman. She's the author of the new book, Connect First, 52 Simple Ways to Ignite Success, Meaning, and Joy at Work. It's out October 22nd. Melanie, where can people get the book or connect with you? Anything that you want to point people to would be awesome before we leave. So you can get the book on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, IndieBound, any one of your favorite booksellers. Definitely go ahead, order it now. Pre-sales allow you to have the book as soon as it comes out and be one of the first on the block to talk about it. You can follow me at Melanie Katzman on Twitter. I'm on LinkedIn and also on Facebook. So come visit me on my page and like me. It's been a pleasure having you on the show, Melanie. Thank you. Thank you so much. I've really enjoyed our conversation. 